certainly one thing about these uh, crazy times we're currently living in is it has gotten all of us to get to know our technology just a little bit better. So <laughs> if you see me looking down or looking over, I'm looking at notes that are posted all over my, my table, uh, as well as uh, my phone with their hard messages coming in and so forth. So um, lots of fun for all of us. We're just going to give it one or two more minutes as, as more of our guests sign on and we will get started. Thank you. I'll be reminding guests about this later as well, but after today's event is over, sometime in the next day or uh, week, we will be sending you the recorded version of this event. And so if you miss anything during the event, you'll be able to watch it over again and send us questions directly if you think of them after we have all disappeared from your screens. The number of our attendees is still rising. I know that all of us are quite busy and um, signing in right on time. The number of guests is jumping up. So we'll just give it another minute or so, if uh, you don't mind. Thank you. And uh, I'll apologize now if my home phone rings. <laughs> um, ignore it. <laughs> uh, and on the other end of the house, uh, my partner is working in, on his own web conferences. So if you hear any strange noises in the background, that's someone at the opposite end of the house doing exactly what we're doing here. So I think we're going to get started. So again, I'm Robert Calafiore. I am the Assistant Dean at the Hartford Art School, University of Hartford, and I welcome you to our virtual event. I've done a lot of these, and like you, I love to be face-to-face. -face. Unfortunately, today's circumstances don't allow that, and so we are going to do our best at bringing you something that we would normally bring you on campus. Many of you have been to campus, and we hope that you enjoyed your visit. And once it is safe to return to campus and move out, I hope that you can join us at some point in the future. Um, I've done a lot of these. This is probably the first time I've done one wearing my slippers. And I have to say, it's, uh, it's quite comfortable. <laughs> um, an overview of today's event. Once again, for those of you who didn't hear it uh, when we first uh, were talking before the event got started, I'm going to introduce our Dean, Nancy Stewart, in just a minute, and she will welcome you, and she has a short uh, introduction for you and some thoughts about the Hartford Art School and the future of our school. Following her discussion, we have a, a short video for you, about four and a half minutes. It is uh, quite remarkable, and we hope that you are as thrilled with it as we are. After the video, there will be a slide presentation. We will review our department offerings, our uh, area offerings, all of the things that you can uh, look into that you might be interested in um, focusing on once you're at the Hartford Art School. Another short video which will highlight one of our alums, alumna Aviva Kapust. And that will be followed by our three amazing faculty members. So if you give me just a moment, I'm going to load up the video and we will, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to introduce Nancy Stewart, Dean of the Hartford Art School. Thank you, Nancy. 
Thank you, Bob, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to my home in West Hartford. I have to say this is the first time I've uh, done uh, this kind of event uh, from the comfort of my living room. Um, for over a year now, the administrative leadership of the Hartford Art School have been discussing our collective future. You know, for decades, we thrived as a well-regarded institution of art and design situated on a comprehensive campus between New York City and Boston. We knew that change uh, was imperative because the students themselves have changed. For instance, our 2019 first year class is 59% female, 43% uh, first generation to attend college, and 34% uh, students of color. Art making itself has also changed radically. Artists are more interesting, interested in crossing disciplinary boundaries. So in response, our uh, curriculum will become more flexible with students encouraged to reach outside their departments to master the multiple tools that they need. We want to help students explore their interests and aspirations and work with them to create an educational experience that leads to lifelong learning. I think the Hartford Art School's strength is its balance between the fine arts and the applied arts. Both are grounded in intensive study of art history. We hope to clearly articulate the value of our art education in the next 90 minutes but to begin with, I'd like to share some of the initiatives we're planning for the future. We believe that you can change the world through the arts. We provide students the tools and the cultural literacy to begin that journey, and one I feel we need now more than ever. We will foster increasing multidisciplinary opportunities by enhancing choices that students have for electives in courses both within and outside the art school. And our programs will develop intentional and transferable skills in students that encourage connecting, collaborating, and succeeding in the arts uh, economy. Our focus on workforce readiness is supported by a rigorous professional practices curriculum that will build year to year and provide significant internship opportunities. We are also designing an interdisciplinary Bachelor of Arts degree in studio arts with multiple minor options throughout the campus. We are proposing to add animation and gaming to our media art offerings, and we are exploring four plus one graduate programs in art education and art entrepreneurship to offer students a more formalized career path. As we realize our own goals at the Hartford Art School, I hope you'll join us to realize yours. I look forward to seeing you on campus in the near future. And until then, stay safe. Thanks. Over to you, Bob. Thanks so much, Nancy. I think the video that follows illustrates well Nancy's remarks and the um, thoughts around why arts are so important in our world, especially now. So if you just give me a moment, I will load up the video. It's about four and a half minutes, but I think you're going to find that it flies right by. It's extremely interesting.
if you'll just give me a moment, I will. Shut down the video and we will all reappear in, in 10 seconds or so. There we are. I hope you enjoyed that. We are going to move uh, directly into our slide presentation. And um, if you'll again give me just a moment, I will load that. And so we start here with our wonderful Pegasus, and you've probably been seeing that um, in some of our Instagram posts, on our catalog cover and in other places. And to give you some contact, context, this particular version of the Pegasus was redrawn or drawn by a current student, Jesse Price, who you may have heard this morning between 9 and 11 on the University of Hartford's Instagram as he did an Instagram takeover of the university's um, platform answering questions for art students throughout the morning. Uh, the original inspiration for this comes from a medallion that the Hartford Art School used early on in its history as a commencement medallion. The art school was founded in 1877, and there's a lot to learn about that if you haven't already. So uh, visit our website, hartford.edu slash art, and learn more about the Pegasus and our entire program. We are going to move through all of the offerings at the Hartford Art School, both the studio, areas and the art history area. We offer a Bachelor of Fine Arts in eight studio areas and a BA, a Bachelor of Arts in Art History. We'll, we'll go over each of these just a little bit. Here are a few shots of the campus. Oops, sorry. Our foundations here. Jeremiah Patterson, who's professor, professor in foundations, you'll be meeting later and getting a great look at his studio, may uh, speak about foundations a little bit more from his perspective teaching drawing and painting uh, when he um, shows you his studio. But basically, our foundations program, first year program, covers all critical areas. It's really important early on to continue building your skill in technique and material, as well as understanding how to do research and develop ideas. So the two begin to merge in this foundation year. The foundation year covers drawing, two-dimensional design, three-dimensional design, 4D design, as well as art history and creative writing or writing. It's important to marry the skills that you learn in the academic classrooms at the university across its six other colleges with what you do in the studio. And there are many, many opportunities to merge those and you'll learn a little bit about them as we go along. So here are some of our freshman courses and freshman work. Ashley Berube, Roxy Ryan and Rebecca Lee are with us from the Hartford Art School admission team and Ashley will tell us a little bit about ceramics. Hi everyone. So our ceramics department focuses primarily on hand building and wheel throwing. As you can see in some of the student work, which is on the next slide, students focus on anything from handheld utilitarian objects like mugs, sculptures, and a more realistic representation of what ceramics can look like. We have our own clay lab, glazing lab, and 16 kilns that are available both indoor and outdoor. Hey Bob, could we get the next slide? Yes. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay. Is that okay? That's perfect. Great. 
In the bottom middle photograph is just a small portion of our facilities. Tables in the front for hand building, we have wheels in the back, as well as studio spaces up above. As part of our, um, as part of all of our departments and the Hartford School, um, we have a visiting artist and guest faculty program. Most recently, we've had internationally recognized artists such as Mark Burns and Kathy Butterly, who have had shows in our galleries as well as taught full semesters in our ceramics department. Okay, thank you so much. Moving on to our sculpture department. Sculpture covers a, a vast area of, of techniques and materials and ideas and ways of thinking and making. The facility is spectacular. I hope that you were able to visit us prior to our closing, but again, if you haven't, hopefully you'll be able to visit soon. We have areas covering wood shop, metalworking, welding, a CNC machine, 3D printers, a glass and bronze casting facility, hot shop, cold shop, working with plaster, figure modeling, a wide variety of areas. This is a great opportunity to talk about double majors and minors across the campus as well as within the art school. Here you see some of our facilities and some of the student work. For instance, if you were wanting to cast life-size giraffe in um, some kind of resin. You could pair that with mechanical engineering classes. And so in a, in a gallery setting, you have this giraffe that suddenly vibrates or moves or bends its neck as you walk it because it has a motion sensor in it. There are many ways to combine what you can learn on campus and bring it together with what you're studying in the art school. For photography, I'll ask Rebecca Lee to talk about this area. Hello, sorry, my mic was muted, adjusting to technology. Um, so I'm going to talk about our photography major. Our photography studios include several Mac-based computer labs, each equipped with professional scanners and printers. We have a full lighting studio and a large black and white dark room, as well as a full color dark room, which is really amazing. Students begin learning in black and white, shooting all of their own film, learning to develop and print in the dark room, then moving those skills into the color dark room, and then into a digital process. So students learn how to apply these analog processes into whatever digital process can apply to that. In all of our studios, students are learning a really wide range across the entire medium so that they can make educated decisions on how to approach their own work. In addition, all art students have the option to study abroad in many amazing locations in the world. In photography, a really popular destination has been London. Sounds fun. Um, through studying abroad, art students are able to learn how to make work while traveling in various settings around the world. Thanks so much, Rebecca. That was fantastic. And Roxy will tell us a little bit about printing. So, um, printmaking is the process of creating artwork or imagery on a block or a plate. Um, so you can have multiple copies of that artwork. And our printmaking studio is a large collaborative space. It houses 12 printmaking presses for use in the different types of print media that we offer. Students can explore lithography, etching, relief, monotype, letterpress, and book arts. And um, printmaking is a process-based medium, so it allows you to really explore the balance between skill and experimentation. Students become flexible artists and creative thinkers, and those are skills that will serve them well in a variety of career paths. 
Um, across all programs, there are a lot of internship opportunities, and these allow students to gain valuable work workforce experience um, and also create connections. In printmaking, we've recently had students that have interned with our alumni, AJ Masson and Kate Lennon, at their print shop called The Furnace. It's, uh, it's based in Hartford, and they're focused on using traditional print techniques and forging dynamic work from fine arts to stationery. Um, and also, later in the presentation, you will be hearing from uh, Tatiana Potts, our professor in printmaking, and she'll be doing a bookmaking demonstration. So you might hear a little bit more about printmaking from her as well. Thank you so much, Roxy. Having a little bit of trouble meeting my mic when others are speaking. So if there's a little bit of uh, feedback, I hope it's not too disturbing, but I'll keep working on that. Our next two uh, departments, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't. This here is the printmaking. Uh, here are the printmaking facilities of the student work. And our next departments: painting. Uh, we're well, starting with painting and drawing. Painting and drawing covers again a variety of areas, and I won't say too much about it because you'll be hearing from Professor Kat Balco as she tours you through her studio. But like all of our departments, there's a great effort on the faculty's part through curriculum to work with students forwarding student interests. Of course, early on in your learning, there'll be specific assignments, techniques, and thinking to cover. Why? But as you move towards junior and senior year, where you have developed your own ideas, faculty will work with you specifically to push those ideas forward. So we hope that in all of our departments, there is a really broad approach to making and thinking. And this takes place in painting as well. And I'll let Kat tell you a little bit more about that later. Here are some of our painting facilities, if you have not seen them, and some of the great painting work that is being made. Visual communication design is another one of our areas of study. And this falls into the applied arts along with illustration, which I believe is the next department after this. And so in this department, you can choose to eventually work for an in-house design firm at say an insurance company, at a retail firm, at a big design firm, at a small boutique firm, you might launch out and begin your own firm. What you'll learn through visual communication design is not only what we used to call graphic design, which refers more to print-based material, but also web design, new digital platforms and electronic design that is seen at this point on the smallest of computers, our phones, daily, millions of times. So a lot to learn in terms of software programs, but also in doing the kind of research it takes to understand how to market to a particular segment or audience. So if I want to sell more Puma sneakers than Nike sneakers, it's not simply a matter of great design, but it's a matter of great research. What is it about the particular product or event that you're trying to draw an audience to that you can understand on behalf of your client and then work into the design. So it's, it's about, again, both the technique and understanding how to use computer technology and other tools, but also research and bringing all of those things together. And here are some of those facilities, some of our faculty teaching and some of that artwork. A lot of this is in our catalog, if you already have it, and of course on our website. And I would also encourage you to take a look at each of the faculty members teaching in all of the departments and visit their own personal websites to learn more about them. Our illustration department, also one of the applied arts. And here are some of our facilities, which include both traditional painting and drawing techniques, as well as digital illustration. Uh, we do have a uh, a track, a minor track in animation within the illustration department. 
And so again, you're balancing both. The traditional media Nancy spoke about earlier combined with new technologies, how those two things can work together, enhance each other, and go forward. And within illustration, you will learn not only about specific materials and techniques like you have, like we have said about each of the other departments, but also areas in which illustration is heavily focused, children's books, advertising, and editorial works, political cartooning, et cetera. And our integrated media arts, I believe the last of our Bachelor of Fine Arts programs, um, takes and combines a lot of technology and allows students to use it in new and innovative ways. So unlike a commercial department, this department focuses on ideas and bringing those ideas to life through areas like video, creative computing, and animation. These are all tracks within the integrated media arts department. You can combine study here with study across campus in the Department of Communications and other areas which allow you to bring together the use of technologies, but also ways of thinking how to use the technology. And here we have a few shots of our beautiful studio and some of our computer facilities and artwork. And of course, in all of these um, departments, you have the opportunity to exhibit your work and your ideas throughout the year in different ways. Our art history department is a critical component of all of our studies. Knowing what came before us is essential to making everything moving forward. Understanding that history puts you in a much stronger place to move forward and make work, work that not only references that history, but pushes it, pushes it along. These slides are provided by the art history department, faculty within that department. So some of the highlights of their program, discovering art, culture, and history of the world, learning to decode our increasingly visual world, mastering writing and critical thinking skills, and so forth. Art history really prepares you to think analytically. It is one of the best ways to understand how to take something apart. You will spend four years looking thinking, researching, talking, and writing about all of the work that's been made in our world, in different cultures, throughout different times, and so on. Those analytical skills are completely transferable to so many areas across the globe and the workforce. The art world today, global art sales, and some of you, if you've attended our events on campus, have seen some of these numbers. Global art sales reached $64 billion in 2017. That's up 12% in 2016. Average wealthy individuals and investors currently allocate 9% of their portfolio. The market for contemporary art grew 564% from 2004 to 2012. That's pretty remarkable. Auction houses, art fairs, commercial galleries, and private museums are all expanding every year. And in this new world of online living, reinventing how we broadcast artwork across the globe is critical. Directors, curators, art advisors, gallerists, educators, these are all growing markets. And finally, other areas that art history majors go into, business and finance and international relations and so forth, as you see on the screen. A great article about art historians is one that I read recently, and if you Google, you can easily find how an art history major came to manage a billion dollars in client assets on Wall Street. It's about a nine or 10 page article that talks about the skills learned in art history and how they transferred to understanding the market without having a financial background, to understanding the market, seeing trends, and so forth. A lot of this we will encourage you to research on your own. And so we're going to now quickly, before our uh, last video and our faculty presentations, 
just show you a few articles that you can go ahead and uh, make note of and then take a look at yourself. But this one on why study art history is quite valuable. Now, this article on new evidence of the benefits of arts education will be um, discussed by Ashley. This article highlights that through more exposure to arts education, students show an improvement in standardized testing for writing, empathy for others, an increase in school engagement, and college aspirations. The research concludes that a well-rounded education has never been more important. Thanks, Ashley. These next two articles, Art Matters More Than Ever During, COVID, during the COVID-19 Crisis and Why Top Tech CEOs Want Employees with Liberal Arts Degrees are really fantastic reads, and I encourage you to take a look at both of these. This article about STEM to STEAM, adding the A in STEM, we all hear about science, technology, engineering, and math, but there's also a huge movement to add art into that acronym. And here to tell you a little bit about that is Roxy Ryan. Hello. So uh, just like he said, this in this article, um, Art in Action is really calling our attention to the importance of putting that A into STEAM. And they discuss five critical skills that students learn through an arts education. Um, and you may have even heard us talk about these before. Creativity, collaboration, confidence, cultural awareness, empathy, and critical thinking. These skills prepare students with what they need to become successful, well-rounded thinkers, just like Ashley was saying before. Um, and they're key for navigating the 21st century workplace. Thanks so much, Roxy. And this final article on why med schools are now requiring art classes, uh, here is Rebecca to tell you a little bit about that. So this article on RC focuses on how through the artistic process of painting, observing, and writing, medical students learn to better communicate with their patients. Visual art also offers medical professionals the opportunity to stop and think by incorporating these important creative skills. Thanks so much, Rebecca. We also have a list of articles for you. This is just a fraction, a tiny fraction of the research that is out there on why the arts are so important to our world, where they have been in the past, where they are now, and where they'll be in the future. Again, for those of you who didn't hear it early on, started the presentation. This is being recorded, and we will send you the presentation um, at some point in the next day or week so that you can access all of this information. And finally, before we move on to our video, I just remind you that the question and answer box is there for you. Go ahead and send us questions if you have any, both for our team or faculty as they make their presentations, and we will get to you either on the spot or at the end of our demonstrations. And so the next um, piece will be a video from one of our alums. And if you just give me a minute to stop sharing this screen for a second. There we go. And I'm going to load up the video. The video is about an alumna who graduated um, some time ago, maybe 50 years or so ago. Her name is Aviva Kapust. She graduated from the Visual Communication Design Department. She moved to eventually move to New York City, and she had an extremely successful career in commercial graphic design for about 10 years. She moved to the West Coast for a little while and then decided to go to the East Coast and wound up in Philadelphia and has reinvented herself. She wanted to take her skill in communication, which she was using in New York commercially to sell product, to draw attention to um, events, et cetera, for clients, and use that communication skill to do completely to do something completely different. And that that difference was to help make a difference in the lives of other people. So she is the director 
of the Village of Arts and Humanities in Philadelphia, where she manages a huge team to help make change in a neighborhood, in a specific neighborhood in Philadelphia through the arts. You may have heard us talk about her a little bit, but this video comes up and it's quite short. And if you'll, again, just give me a moment to bring it up. Give me a moment to out of the video. I'll be sharing in seconds here. There we are. And I think um, what's really poignant there is in Aviva's last sentence there about making change. We can make change. And Nancy started us off in this entire. Um, conversation with the idea that we can change the world through art. So we're going to move on to our faculty presentations and our first professor, Tatiana Potts in printmaking, is up now. Thank you, Tatiana. After Tatiana will be Jeremiah Patterson and followed immediately by Kat Balco. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. It was taking me a little technology. <laughs> um, trying to um, navigate is, is not showing. Okay, here we go. I'm so sorry. So here we go. So pre-making department, as it was mentioned before, it's a sort of extension of drawing. Those drawing and compositional skills are developed along with uh, those print making and uh, the classes there mentioned before include lithography, etching, relief, letterpress, and book art. Uh, also important um, thing is to mention our print workshop when we invite uh, well-known printmakers such as Art Berger, Sean Caulfield, or Tanya Sovtich, who will work in the studio and students will have opportunity to talk to this um, established artist and actually find out how it works in the real world, how they can apply their skills. Um, also, we had in past where hosted well-known artists such as uh, Jim Dine, Helen Frankenthaler, or uh, James Rosenquist. So I already mentioned we have uh, several different techniques that the students can take as soon as second semester freshman with the seven a week print shop intensive. We also have a print club that is run by students and this way students have opportunity to sell their work, raise money to go for conferences or learn from each other, which is very exciting. Also how we promote and share our work. Here is the Instagram page that I uh, encourage you to check out. It's, uh, this one is dedicated to prints or printmaking, all those processes. And then on this second page, Hard Book Art, we share the book, books and book forms that students currently creating or created before. In some other slides that I'd like you to uh, see over here is uh, directly from the studio. So here we see pressure printing 
that our bookmaker is also experiencing printmaking. So it's not only bookmaking itself, but also they are in, um, exposed a little bit to how to actually make the print in multiple. Once we printed all that, this was opportunity that students actually swap the prints that each of them printed enough for each other. And then from the pages that they already got that they created their own book with shared prints. Here we have another shot from print shop when Italian relief area is with etching presses in view with the giant wheel that you see in the view and students who is at the table there. Um, the next slide shows the little press when we usually use the stone or other plates that are being printed on. And here is the bookmaking area, letter press area where we have different types and people can set up their illustration or the type such as here that it would be ready to print as you can see it here. In several few slides, I would like to share some of the artwork of the students. This is concretely by Mallory. Um, it's an intaglio, which means that it was done on a copper plate and was etched in acid bath and then printed with intaglio ink. Um, this one was done, uh, it's a lithograph that was done on plate. It also can be utilized on stone, so you're directly drawing on aluminum plate and create a drawing. As it was mentioned before, what's the ideal about pre-making is that you use your drawing skills, but you can do multiple. So you can play with layering, you can play many, so the prints don't feel as precious. And you can experiment and then expose yourself to other different um, areas how to apply it for making itself. Um, here we have an example of relief printing by same day, which um, required about two or three blocks of so the line work that you see that was card on one block, linoleum block. In the background that was printed in different colors, she used another block to print over. Um, here we have an example of the artist book by Matt Morello where he printed the illustration on the right and on his left, the type was set on the letter on the letter press. Um, here we have a, com a composition of many books together uh, for the artists, uh, my book making students who were finishing their work. This was particularly what I usually encourage them to do two mock-ups. One would be the mini book and the other one would be a little larger. So we learn all the troubleshootings, how the books works and what kind of problems we might have depending on the size. Um, and then here is a shot from the critique that we were sharing the book, sharing experiences and troubles or what we learned during this process, how we can make it better. Um, in this last two slides, I would like to share some of my work. This is my most recent part that I've been working on several books. One is the tiny little book that you see at the beginning is about one inch tall and the tallest one is 12 inch, where I was challenging myself to see how I can compose the content and be challenged by the space. Now, I would like to go larger, but unfortunately I run out of material because currently I'm stationed not in my studio, but in Tennessee instead of Connecticut. So there's the COVID influence when I have to work with what I have. Uh, here's some close-up, um, and there's my last slide that I want to share here. So you see a few of these books that are there, and I will show you in the uh, live once I quit sharing. Um, and let's see, so it says stop sharing. So I should be, um, I'm guessing that you see me currently or not, not you don't see me. Right now you should be able to see me, right? Yes, okay. So what I was also wanted to show you is some of the blocks. So there is an example right here on the wood, wood block that I actually carved um, right here and use whatever I have available. And here's the print that I use, regular open acrylics and not even typical ink. So I'm just kind of improvising with material that I have. Um, the tiny little books that I was going to show you and uh, show you on in the video, you see there's this one inch book that is very tiny. And as I progress to larger sizes, um, this is maybe the middle size about four inches and it led up to here is the largest book that is 12 inch. So you can see that you can really play with the different sizes of the book. 
as I mentioned before, uh, we do we do uh, play with the mini books first, and that is the reason to actually explore troubleshooting. And I'm going to pull my camera down so you can actually see my work desk first, and then I'll show you the mini demo how to make a sketchbook quickly. So you see the mini books over here. As you see, like in this uh, place, when I'm in extended studio, not exactly mine, I was using materials which are, which are available to me. So it's not necessarily all fancy material, right? Even the covering book with the material and fabric that I actually have only available, not necessarily buying the fa fancy material. Or even this fun book um, with the shape of the fish. But moving on to what I was gonna show you is some simple use of the material you might have at home. Sorry, upside down, Coca-Cola. Um, now you can see what I drink here. <laughs> this one is done with a cover from Seltzer, which I actually, actually cut out another material from another box that I would have actually recycled. Here is my print that I previously showed you, and it's just plain um, sketchbook papers that I actually used uh, to make a book. So how do we proceed it if you wanted to do that? And this is usually a typical project for me for my first day with students, make your own sketchbook. And why? Because it becomes not as precious, but also you will be able to fill it all up. Admit it, how many of us bought a very fancy sketchbook and you were afraid to draw in it because it was too pretty, right? So this way, this book will allow you to actually experiment and draw anything in it. So here I have the paper from the sketchbook. There are about five sheets, folded them in half. Then I cut my cover. This one is from Seltzer Water, um, about the size of the paper. Um, use about five sheets. You can decide on different number, fold it in half, put my illustration in the center. And now all you need to do is sew it together. You might wonder how you know where to sew. For this particular form, you need three holes. In order to make them, I made a template for it, which is right here. Um, align it in the center. And first, I would usually punch the paper first. So as you see, I'm holding in the center, align exactly the same. Grab my punching tool, otherwise known as all. A W L, punch it through. Then you have nice three holes. If you do the same for your book cover, which I already did, and maybe it's a little harder to see, there where you will help. It will be helpful to actually align it, and your book cover book pages will go together. So now all you need is a needle and a thread. Again, I mentioned I'm not necessary in my studio, so I don't have a material available. You can totally use the embroidery thread or the floss uh, to make it stronger. What you want to do is take a wax. In this case, I'm using regular candle and just drag it through the, through the candle to make it really stronger so it doesn't slip and is also stronger when you sew. When you sew this, you really need a few little steps. You do not make a knot at the beginning. Align your pages and you start from the center. As I'm going to try to navigate through this when I'm looking on the video. Um, so I go in the center, pull it through, hold it with my thumb so it doesn't go all the way out, turn it over, do the second, second hole, pull it through. So I have a first stitch. Turn it over and go in the center again. So I have one stitch, do the same for the other hole. Put it in. Then again, I'll go through the center. And there is one more step. Of course, there's sometimes it's gonna tinkle, especially on the demo, right? Um, now we have this end and this end. So we need to make sure we can go and meet them on the other side. So in order to do that, we'll just wrap it around so the thread doesn't come through since we went through that hole and go in the hole again, bring it on the other side and all we do, and I hope you can see it, all we do is 
tie a square knot, sort of a knot like you put on your shoelaces, if they still exist, because most of the shoes now have the Velcro, right? And then you just trim the endings, and there's your little sketchbook that you can carry in your um, backpack or handbag and just sketch anywhere you are. So there you go. That will be it for me. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, small demo on book making. We have more fun making more other books or in pre-making studio printing the pages and content for your book. So thank you for joining me. And next, I'll turn it over to our professor, drawing and painting, uh, Jeremiah Patterson. So now, can everybody hear me? Can everybody hear me now? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and share first some images from um, my work to sort of explain where I come from. So, welcome to my studio. This is Jeremiah Patterson, and I'd like to show you some examples of my work. And so you can see here that um, these are some of my watercolor still life paintings. Um, I work in a variety of genres, a variety of subject matter from still life like this with watercolor. Um, and examples such as this uh, painting called Yellow Apples. Uh, so I work in a variety of genre but, um, and subjects, but my medium of choice for my own work is watercolor. And I've really spent most of my um, adult life painting with this very beautiful transparent painting medium. Um, I also work outdoors uh, while I'm traveling with the medium with watercolor, and um, it allows me to paint in locations that I've traveled, such as Italy or Sicily or France. And it really uh, allows me to build artworks that um, are quicker and more based on sketching. Uh, the bottom line for me is that everything begins with drawing. And so I'm a professor of foundation and I teach drawing and I teach color theory. And in in terms of drawing, I'm a real believer that practice and practice and practice and doing a lot of drawing is what's going to get you to a finish line. These are some of my drawings of my daughters, Anna and Melanie. And uh, everything that I've done with my work um, comes through drawing. These are some examples of another genre of my work, uh, another subject matter, figure paintings. And these figures are um, in a lot of cases, life size. I'll give you a quick little tour of my studio once these slides are done um, so that I can give you a little bit of a sense of where I work and how I work. This is one of the more recent paintings of my daughters with their fr uh, friend, uh, Keita, my daughter braiding Keita's hair. A very recent project as well was um, came upon me just a year ago, and it was to redesign the interior of a church. And so this was the original interior of the altar. What I did was I created niches for behind the statuaries. These are actually painted on a surface, so they're flat, but they look three-dimensional. And a crucifix that was to hang above the main altar. And again, this was the before image of the altar before my redesign was put into place. And then this is the redesign as it exists now in its place. So that's a very quick little um, tidbit of my work. I'm putting on here my email address and my website. I would really like all of you to email me after the meeting because I'd like to share with you my YouTube page where I've been posting tutorials on drawing and on painting, specifically watercolor and I'd be more than happy to share them so that you can continue to learn a little bit before coming and visiting us at the art school. And so at this point, what I'd like to do is to um, stop sharing this and actually go back and share my other camera so that I can bring you around my studio and show you a little bit about what I do in the studio. So this is gonna be a little handheld with my iPhone to show you where I work. My wife, oh, this is where the 
action happens for these meetings. Um, my wife and I live with our two daughters and our dog in 900 square foot, a little cottage. And so I'm a big believer in tiny house living and I have a fairly small studio that we can give you a little tour of quite quickly as I rotate around. Um, the painting that I'm currently working on here is a watercolor, it's called The Love Letter. And it's a painting that is going to be heading over to Italy once the COVID-19 outbreak in Italy um, changes and um, the show is gonna be postponed, but it's gonna be happening later in the year. Um, some of my landscapes over here in the corner, these uh, a series of tree watercolors that I've been working with. Um, one of my artistic heroes, a poster of Andrew Wyeth's work. On the top, my father's painting, he was my main number one teacher. When I was in college, that's actually another one of my father's paintings in the corner. This here is a work in progress that is um, another one of the series of figures with windows that I've been working with. And in the corner, another bit of my kind of wall of fame, my father's self-portrait, that's his painting that he made when he was around my age. Below that is a design done by my grandfather. He was a, an architect in Hartford. And my father actually is an alum of the Hartford Art School, as, uh, as is uh, myself. I was I graduated with a Master's of Fine Arts degree in the year 2000. So what I'd like to do now is stop. So now I'm going to come back and let me see if I can um, turn on my computer's camera. And I don't know if everybody can see me or not. And there we are. So that's a little tour of my place. And if there are any questions at the end of today, I'd be happy to answer them. I'm going to turn it over to Professor Kat Balco, who's going to finish off the visits of Studio Spaces. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to my studio. It's, uh, it's, it's so great to have this um, connection through the airwaves. Just so you know, about two minutes ago, the most enormous thunderstorm came through and hail fell on the studio and I thought for a minute I was going to totally lose my connection but it's um it's great to get to have a chance to share my work with you um I'm going to start by talking a little bit about my painting and about my practice and then connect that to how I teach at the art school so first I'm going to share um some images from a recent show that I had so these the the paintings that you'll see are from a show that uh just closed in February in New York at Rick Wester Fine Art. Um, see if I can there we go. Uh, this is a show of, of lo pretty large paintings. So the paintings ranged between um, six by six, which is the size of this painting, and uh, and, and and about um, I think the smallest were about uh, four by four. You can see that I'm really interested in color in in bright, vibrant color. Um, you can also see in the work that I often have, you can see it especially in this painting, this slight sense of a, of a drop shadow as if even though these were these are completely abstract paintings, sometimes they, they look like they occupy real space. Um, and that's something that, I, that I'm interested in. Uh, my, my beginnings as a painter were as a, uh, a landscape painter. So representation and particularly using paint to show space is something that, that I'm really interested in. Um, in my scale is, is extremely important in my work, as you can tell from these images. Uh, like a group of, um, of uh, now well, how do I unshare here? Stop sharing, okay. So coming back to my studio, I'm gonna leave you with this painting um, and you'll come back to my studio and see this, uh, this big painting behind me in the space. Like uh, one of the most famous groups of American abstract painters, the abstract expressionists who worked in the middle of the 20th century, I'm really interested in paintings being worlds, paintings being so large and expansive that viewers kind of can lose themselves in them. So, so um, obviously paintings the scale of the paintings that I make are, would be difficult to put in a 
reasonably sized house like mine, right? Or they're, they're not the kind of paintings that make you think about picture windows. They're the sort of paintings which envelop you and create an environment. And um, maybe if you do it right, change your kind of idea about, uh, about maybe what's, what's possible in the world around you. Um, I, uh, because I paint so, uh, such large paintings, I've had to make a lot of innovations in terms of my tools and materials. So, um, and I should say before that I, when I started working this way, my idea for working at this scale actually came from um, a studio visit with a friend who took little teeny pictures of, of other paintings of mine and, um, and shared them with me. And I was so excited about what those little tiny detailed sections of my paintings looked like that I wanted to make them really large. Um, so to figure out how to do that, I uh, got myself some brooms, some industrial brooms, um, which I attach to broomsticks, just like this. Um, you know, I screw this right on here. Uh, and then when I'm ready to make my paintings, I take my large canvases, I put them on the floor, I pour the paint on them, and then I brush it out with a broom across the painting. When I discovered that this that this would work, that I could make a painting that had a brush mark using the broom. I was excited because the, um, the, the materials have a kind of personal significance to me. I'm, um, I've lived, my family's lived in Connecticut for four generations. We came over as European immigrants and worked in factories in Eastern and um, Eastern Connecticut and, and in the Naugatuck River Valley. And so this, I, my family has this history of, of laboring and, um, and when I'm in the studio, I'm often thinking about the, the people who come before me, the, particularly the women who came before me in my family, who've kind of gotten me to a place where I, um, where I have this incredible opportunity to make work. Um, so so the, the act of using my broom takes me back to those earlier members of my family who worked uh, so hard to kind of create the life that I'm, that I, that I'm able to kind of have now, which is, which is pretty magical. Um, when, um, when, when I was thinking about um, talking to you about how my practice relates to my students, I, um, I wanted to sort of talk a little about how uh, I'm holding this huge goopy bucket of paint right here, right? And you can see that um, when, I, when I make these large paintings, I have to use these big paint buckets to mix this paint. And I, um, I develop, when I work on my paintings, all of these cards and cards of color because every time I make mix the painting I mix the color wrong like you know 30 times before I mix it right and I, I can't bear to totally let go of that color um, because always those colors are sort of hard won. look at that beautiful lavender right <laughs> so if a paint if a paint color doesn't have life in my painting it always has life in this book um, but this kind of material familiarity this kind of uh, just a hands-on experience with, with working with materials uh, over and over again, so that so much that you that they, they, they kind of become like friends. Um, in the painting department, this is something which we emphasize quite a bit, particularly in the first part of our program. Um, our, our intro classes are two, we have two semesters of intro classes, which students usually take during the first year, their, their sophomore year. And, um, and in those classes, we give them projects where they are just like, just like I am doing, they are working with paint, they are mixing mostly from observation, not working abstractly, but, but starting to get comfortable with what, um, with what, these, materials, with what these materials can do. Um, I find uh, in our department, I think a lot about um, a, a kind of spectrum between uh, assignment-based projects or, and projects that I call investigations. So an assignment, a studio assignment would be something like um, giving students a still life, uh, a very specific still life to look at and a very specific color palette to work, work with and an example of what, what I want the still life to look like and asking them to kind of, to make, to get to that point, to get to that painting of the still life. And investigation is different in that it gives students a starting point, you know, and then asks them to explore widely using the the, the, the tools that we've provided for them. So an example of an investigation might be, um, I want you to think about light. You know, you've learned how to create the illusion of light with paint. Now I want you to make a painting that's about light. 
Now, that's kind of like a headache kind of project because, you know, there's so many ways that that painting can go. Um, but that kind of having to find your way through open-ended projects like that is a um, is very important part of the work of an artist. And when, um, when I am sculpting or when I'm creating a, a semester for the students, I'm trying to think, how can I get them from a place where they're making investigations, where they're kind of successfully completing investigations, to, I mean, sorry, from a place where they're successfully completing assignments to a place where they're able to move into these open-ended investigations um, as we all do when we're sort of working as, um, as artists. Um, also, critically, I want my students to have uh, an understanding of the contemporary and historical context that exists around them um, as painters. Um, I want them to understand the world that they fit into, the way that they, uh, that, that they want, the, the peers that they're going to be communicating with, um, the, the way that they're going to be, uh, you know, our fine art world is a, is a community of connections and it's really important for our young artists to kind of understand who's working, what kind of work they're making, where their work fits in, um, how to build their network so that they can um, kind of enter the art world showing their work, which is very much about themselves. In, the, in this very alive and active relevant context, which is around all of us, um, all of us contemporary artists today. I also did want to mention that we are, uh, that I also teach an arts and healthcare class. And um, Bob mentioned a couple times in his presentation, some of the, uh, or Bob and the admissions team mentioned a couple times in their presentation, some of the really interesting overlaps that are happening, um, the, the different ways that um, that art is used to, uh, is, is being used outside of an art context in order to create um, kind of really exciting innovations in the healthcare field. Um, my arts and healthcare class meets with uh, one day a week, we work in a nearby healthcare facility and so students have a chance to experience one-on-one uh, -on -one work with residents in the healthcare facility. The students work as expressive artists and um, and uh, the other day a week, they learn from professionals in the field, kind of about the field more generally. So um, I think that's kind of mostly what I wanted to, to share about my practice and the work that I do with students. Um, if there are some questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much. Um... Pat, Tatiana, and Jeremiah, as we all start to reappear here from the rest of the team. Um, thank you, that was absolutely fantastic. Uh, we do have a few questions in our question and answer box, um, but if there are any questions specifically for faculty, go ahead and enter those now. And uh, while we answer some of your other questions, we can then pass those on to faculty. We have about um, 15 minutes or so left um, if we need it. Um, and so some of the questions and um, the whole team, please feel free to join in and answering these. I'll just read off the question and um, anyone who uh, is appropriate for answering, that would be great. Um, so one of the questions is about study abroad. I'm wondering how the study abroad works with the art school. Is there an ability to study in Israel? That's a great question. Study abroad is an absolutely fantastic way to get, get outside of your box and see how other cultures and people think, work, and so forth. Uh, and so study abroad is quite popular. Most of our students will travel to Italy or to England. But there are many other places that you can go, including Israel. We have programs that uh, we've had long relationships with, but we are certainly capable and able to help you find specific programs that we can tie you into in other parts of the world. There are many, many offerings through the university and the art school's office of the associate uh, dean of students is happy to help find things specifically for you. Uh, if there's anything anyone wants to add to that, please do. But it, it definitely, you know, we all start off 
in our high school programs, and they're absolutely fantastic in our, our, our current colleges that we might be transferring from. And we then move on to bigger programs. So the, the box that we're in keeps getting bigger. And when you study abroad, the box suddenly gets much, much bigger. And you're exposed to ways of thinking and looking and seeing and doing that will present themselves to work. It will change the way you work. It will change what your work is about um, and how you approach it. So it's an excellent question. And uh, I, I can't tell you specifically if we've had anyone travel to Israel in a study abroad program. I, I, oh, yeah. yeah I want to add, we had a student this year actually to study abroad in Israel. Great. Fantastic. Um, I don't know about that program specifically, but if you email us offline at some point, we can certainly do that research, find out who it is, maybe even connect you with uh, the student who's abroad, and they can tell you directly what their experience um, was like. So lots of study abroad opportunities. Um, another of the questions was, uh, dual degree options, and um, again, anyone can jump in here. Um, dual degree options, there are different ways to think about it and call it. it double majors, dual degrees, those are different things. Um, minors, subject area majors, there are a lot of ways to combine efforts uh, at the University of Hartford. So the Hartford Art School is one of seven schools and colleges that comprise the University of Hartford. About 4,500 full-time undergraduate students 310 or so in the Hartford Art School program. Um, and so we, you know, I mentioned how you might combine classes and, and take courses in the academic area that will either uh, provide new skills for you or enhance the work you're making. So for instance, outside of the sort of mechanical engineering giraffe example, if you're a painter making work about um, mythological stories, you probably want to take a lot of classes in literature and areas in the academic area that deal with that subject matter. It just flows right into what you're doing in the studio. If you're not great at public speaking, maybe you can take some classes there that will help you. It is incredibly important as an artist to be able to write and speak articulately about what you're doing, why you're doing it, and uh, placing it in context. And we, we don't work in a vacuum in the art world. So understanding what came before you that we talked about, um, that I talked about in, in terms of uh, why art history is so important, um, also applies here in understanding other parts of the world, what's happening in politics, economy, this crisis, um, in healthcare, in, um, in the financial markets, et cetera influences who we are, what we do as people, what we're interested in, what motivates us, and, and how our artwork sits in the world, what it means to people. So it means something different to make uh, the same exact artwork or s deal with the same exact subject matter 100 years ago as it does to do that now, with the context different. And so how people interpret that work, what it means to them will be different. So the, the, there are lots of options there. Either take classes that will give you specific skills you need or select another area that you can combine and do a minor in, something that really you're super interested in, or go the extra step and double major in two areas. That could be within the art school. It could also be art school and other area on campus. And um, I'm not sure, maybe Nancy wants to say something else or if I miss something, faculty, if you want to jump into um, the importance of crossing those boundaries and working outside of the studio. Feel free. You did a really good job, Bob. Um, and I just want to uh, also add that um, it is possible to double major and graduate in four years, but you really need to work with your advisor, which all of us um, uh, faculty, uh, uh, function as advisors, but to work very closely to get the scheduling advice so that it doesn't cause you to stay, you know, an extra semester um, if you're double majoring. So it, it can be done with very careful planning and it's encouraged. Great. Um, another question is about 4D design. What exactly is 4D design? 
and that's the study of four dimensional design. So you have the traditional, what we see in, in all our schools for a long time, and then suddenly as technology has developed, all of us have introduced 4D design or some version of that. And it's really about um, um, time lapse. It's about, um, it's about time. It's about that other dimension that's about sequencing and movement and the elapse of time somehow. So there are lots of ways to approach that. Uh, I don't think I can do it complete justice in, in, in every detail, but that's essentially what it's about. And so um, I, I might ask either uh, um, Tom Pratisto, you might be able to add to that as you're, as you're watching some of those students in the um, freshman 40 course, if you'd like to say anything about it. But it, that is sort of the, uh, the essential what it is. I'm certainly here to answer any questions if someone has uh, anything about 4D, but um, being that it's introduced uh, quite early, I think is, is significant, really giving students an opportunity to, you know, get their hands wet in this and find out, you know, if this is something they want to continue to work with. So please, if you have any questions, uh, write them down. Thank you, Tom. Um, let's see, what am I missing for questions? There have been some questions about transferring and how is that different than coming as a freshman. Um, so the transfer process at the Hartford Art School, University of Hartford, um, we make as simple as possible. Once you have committed to attending, there'll be a review of your credits, a detailed deep review of your credits and how they apply to our programs. We make every effort so that all of the courses you have taken plug in in the best place that they can as much as we can. And so where you enter will be determined by looking at, if you go to our website and the particular major you're interested in, by looking at the curriculum required for that particular BFA. The BFA is a 120 credit program and on the website under each department, it lays out what those credits are. So if you look at freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year, and take a look at the courses that you've already taken, you can begin to sort of pick off the things that seem to align with things that you've already taken, kind of check them off your list, and it'll give you a rough idea of what's left for you. In terms of a difference, uh, and again, anyone on the team jump in, I think um, when you come in as a freshman, you are sort of through the orientation program early on, uh, connecting with a, a core group of people doing exactly what you're doing. When you come in with a transfer, everybody's doing something different. And I guess the most different thing for a transfer student is kind of finding and building that community for themselves really quickly. We do a great job at that at Hartford Art School. It's um, small, and that word is sometimes tricky, it's not small in, in quality or size, or it's small in the way we treat each other. We, we know each other extremely well. So the freshmen are great friends with seniors and so on. It's a tight family knit like structure. So I don't think that's difficult, but I would say that's the one thing I would point to that's different for a transfer student. So it's, it's where do you come in based on what you've already had, how it applies to our program and building a community for yourself, getting to know people quickly so you feel comfortable and a part of um, the family really quickly. Anything, anything you would want to add? I was going to jump in and say that um, in many of our departments, there's a kind of a junior, there's a junior class where, which most juniors take and many students come in as, as junior transfers. Many, many transfer students will find themselves in that uh, junior level class when they begin their work. Um, and we, those classes are for six hours a week and they're tight communities and we spend a lot of time together. Um, so very quickly transfer students become a part of this family. I think uh, this distinguishes, in, in my experience with, with other art schools and other art programs, this family sense that we have at the art school is, um, really distinguishes our program. Thank you, Kat. Bob it's, Bob, it's Jeremiah. I'd like to jump in and answer. There's a couple of questions about um, 
how the online courses are going for freshmen and also about watercolor. I um, was so ask you that exact question. Thank you. So first, I'd like to um, to say that uh, there was also a comment that came in the chat uh, about how I make my watercolors appear so realistic and from Lainey Newman Rodriguez. So please email me if you can remember that um, email address, jpatterso without the N at hartford.edu and I will send you a link to a, a YouTube tutorial. There's really only seven techniques that happen in watercolor and um, I've posted that it has a huge number of views already and you could be another one. But moving along, first of all, with watercolor, it's a medium that is transparent. And so we use the white of the paper to make our color show. And uh, essentially that involves additive color mixing um, where most painting involves subtractive color mixing. And so uh, technically speaking, it's probably the medium that it's the most important to understand color theory in order to get the best out of um, in terms of painting, to get the best out of its transparent qualities. With that being said, it's actually something that I'm very proud of. I was hired at the Hartford Art School more than 20 years ago to revamp a first year foundation course in color theory. And uh, it's something that I've spent really a lifetime involved with. And so we're at the point now with the school where every single student in the first semester goes through this course on color theory that I would argue is one of the most comprehensive and rigorous of any art school that you'll visit. Um, it involves what I would say is the color theory the way it, way it ought to be. Um, so with that in mind, that's uh, in a nutshell the answer to that. I would not exist as a watercolorist without a clear and good, good sense of color theory and how it works. Um, with that in mind, there was another question about um, how online classes are going for foundation level classes. And I, in uh, five minutes, I'm about to go meet my foundation level uh, course that starts at 4.30. Um, I'm quite amazed at how agile the faculty of the art school have been in adjusting to this COVID-19 situation. Uh, it came upon the entire world very, very quickly. As I mentioned earlier, I had received an email that I was invited into a very prestigious show in Italy about two weeks before we were sent home from campus. Uh, for the spring break that then went on for an extension and now um, what has turned into online teaching for the rest of the year. And of course, Italy, right after that, went through an incredible uh, difficulty with this virus. So the world has been just waylaid by this thing. And I am just very proud of what we've done at the art school in terms of being agile, uh, moving classes online. Again, I'm more than happy to share those tutorials that are on YouTube. Many of those are being captured during demonstrations that are being given to students online during the teaching of these classes. Um, this is what our faculty does. This is what we do as artists. I think uh, I mentioned to my students as we were leaving campus and with, that we knew that there was a likelihood we would be teaching online. I said to them, well, if there's a time to be an artist, this isn't a bad one because we're artists are supposed to have some time on their hands. Artists are supposed to have some time to work and, and that's often our nemesis is time. And on top of that, what I would argue strongly is that um, if there's anyone in this world that has built a life of agility that can make the changes necessary to do what we've done, it's an artist. And so while we are all really looking forward to getting back on campus, because there's nothing like seeing faces in a classroom uh, blossom as information is passed along. At the same time, we're doing our very best and we are uh, making the best of a difficult situation for the world. And hopefully, um, if, if the world can embrace this concept of slowing down, they'll be coming to the pace of an artist, finally, and we'll be able to all live in harmony like we've always wanted. So I hope that answers, Bob. And at this point, I do have to, um, leave the meeting. Thank you all very, very much uh, and uh, for your time. And I'm going to jump off so I can go teach my other, my night class. Okay. Thanks so much, Jeremiah. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> um, we have a question about, will the school be open in the fall due to the COVID situation? And uh, if not, how will our classes be handled? 
That's a big unknown. Uh, you know, nobody has the answer to that. And the Hartford Art School and University of Hartford are in the same boat as every other educational uh, institution, every other higher educational institution, as well as K through 12 um, um, teaching schools. Um, we don't know. We hope and expect that we, we will be back in the fall. Uh, but I, I can't make any guarantees, nor can anyone else. The expectation is that, yes, we will be, we will be back in the fall. I, I would imagine, personally, that much like the rest of the world, where grocery shopping has changed and retail shopping has changed and going to the movie theater and how do you work out at home because you can't go to the gym, education may change for a little while as well. I, I just don't know. But for the moment, the expectation is that we will be back on campus in the fall. And if necessary, the university is preparing itself, as well as the art school, for classes to move online for part of the fall, hopefully not the whole fall. But that's the best that I can do. Perhaps um, uh, Nancy might add uh, something to that or just sort of emphasize yeah, that, that's the best answer, Bob, and I can assure everyone that there uh, is a very uh, agile task force uh, working uh, now about scenario planning for all the different contingencies that we might face uh, due to this pandemic. Uh, and so we are hoping for the best, but also planning on uh, various scenarios so that we could uh, be very adaptable and flexible in our response to what we're faced with. Thank you. Um, we have another question about um, any accommodations for anyone with learning disabilities, uh, et cetera. The university has fantastic programming through a variety of sources on campus. Everything from um, minimal uh, um, support like a writing lab to extensive um, support. And um, the best way for me to give you details on that would be for you to email us offline. I'm taking note of, of your name. Email us offline and then um, we can put you in touch with the appropriate people who can give you real details on what exactly is offered. Um, I can only speak generally and say that there is extensive programming for all kinds of needs and all kinds of um, students and ways of learning. If anyone has experience there and wants to add anything to that, that'd be great, but I'd be happy to provide you with all of the links we have um, uh, a resource that we keep handy and so we can email you all of those links with names of uh, the appropriate people who handle those offices. We'd be happy to do that. You can email us at artschool at hartford.edu. Just A-R-T school, artschool at hartford.edu is the easiest way. You could certainly look us up on the university website and find our personal email addresses if you would like and email us um, directly and specifically, but you can use our general email box as well. Did I miss any questions, um, team? Have you seen anything that, um, that we missed? There was one about uh, asking about animation uh, and gaming, minoring in animation and gaming with uh, illustration. And I want to be, there is an animation minor uh, on the books uh, today. And uh, it's very common uh, <clears throat> minor for illustration majors as well as others. The gaming uh, piece we're working on, and uh, that um, you know will be uh, a year away, 18 months away. Um, again, depending upon a lot of, uh, of not knowing what the immediate future is. Uh, bringing our way, but uh, we do have the animation and we're working on the gaming. We also have a document written by faculty in the animation program and in integrated media arts that outlines how animation plays a role in anywhere you're looking to work in the art school, so we can send that to you too. 
Absolutely. Sorry. I also wanted to add that we do have experimental animation through our integrated media arts major. So there's a couple different ways that you can approach animation at the school. And I think that's the great thing about being an artist. Um, many of the same subjects and issues are tackled by different artists in different medias and different approaches uh, with different ideas and perspectives. And that's what makes it dynamic and exciting. And that's what um, generates innovation. Artists are the best at solving problems, thinking critically, analyzing where we are as humans, where we've come from, where we want to go next. And we have great power as artists to influence all of that. That's where this conversation started. And I think that's about where we will end. And so I thank everyone for joining us today. I know that long, maybe a uh, or so, um, but I hope you enjoyed it. Reach out to us. We're here for you. We are here at 30 to um, interview with you. Email us if you'd like uh, to chat. Well, we can set something for you, direct to other people. Um, but I personally thank you for joining us, and I thank the entire for being here, our faculty, Tom Pratisco, who's just our amazing um, faculty and photographer and, uh, and uh, tech guru for video, uh, integrated media arts, photography. Um, we have amazing people. You saw some of them. There are a lot more. So just meet them all. Meet them all. Um, I thank you. Any other last minute blows? But I think going to be it for us. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. Everyone stay safe. Bye. -bye.